paint lounge again, everyone. Um, I've lost count of how many talks we've already done. This must be about seven. Number, number seven. seven. Okay. Um, today on the sofa, we have <laughs> Claire Mitten, um, painter. We've got a sculpture of Liz. Do you want to point out oh. Claire's work? Yes. Now, that's a painting, a three-dimensional painting. Is there one of yours over there as yes, well? Yes, there is, yeah. The same yeah. One. yeah. Surprise, oh, surprise. Yes. Surprise, surprise. Yes. 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 Graham Crowley, an established painter, educator, professor at the Royal College for some time, and we're very welcome, uh, pleased to welcome him as a feminist <laughs> as well. Um, and Rosalind Davies, um, another painter, um, and well, entrepreneur, curator, <laughs> set up, uh, educator, yeah. Um, uh, Zaps. You set up Zaps, I yeah. kind of start projects, yeah. um, and well, yes, we've all heard of Zap. You've done some amazing things. You're now curating at Collier Bristow. Yeah, some amazing exhibitions happening yeah. there. Go and have a look if you haven't already. So Rosalind's painting is the subtle little number at the top, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Graham is uh, the landscape. Yeah. There. So, welcome all. Thank you. Um, I think Graham has a, a statement. Yeah, you well, call it? well, basically, you asked for a topic. <laughs> yes. And I have one that I think is, from my point of view, and it's very much as a practitioner, is a burning issue. And I, it stems, or basically, a little bit of an introduction, or a bit more of an introduction. I went to St Martin's, it's 50 years ago in the next few weeks, right? And so I'm contemporary of people like Gilbert George and stuff like that. I basically was at St Martin's from 67 at the height of and the very, very sort of uh, emergence of three major discourses, right? Feminism, Marxism and conceptualism. And all of those things in now I've been asked to speak today about this idea, uh, impact upon this proposition. And I, I'm of the firm belief that there is such a thing as post-conceptual painting. Because I've actually witnessed the history of painting as a painter, as a student in the 60s, uh, over the last 50 years, right? So I've got a certain investment in the project. I'm, I'm part of that project. Right, I've had to make some notes because I didn't want to actually forget anything because I, I could go straight to the sort of, you know, and that's my thesis and then leave the room <laughs> and go back home to suffer, very happy. Uh, but I, would, I wouldn't be happy, I'd be dissatisfied because anybody who knows me knows that I'm a bit of a completist, particularly when it comes to my vinyl. Hey, Justin. <laughs> and, and my practice, uh, you know, I'm self-diagnosed self OCD, so you'll see that you'll have to put up with it, basically. <laughs> anyway, um, right. I'm convinced that there is such a thing as post-conceptual painting, and it's, it's a phrase that sort of seems to be at the edge of uh, the discourse. And that's another issue. I believe painting is a discourse, it's not simply an activity. That's what distinguishes it from decorating or uh, damp roofing, stuff like that, okay? Um, I believe there is such a thing as uh, post-conceptual painting, and a very, very sort of, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that, and then I'll give you the reasoning behind that, okay? Because the reasoning is much denser than the definition, as you can probably imagine. Basically, it's not just painting that's happened since the 60s, that would be just painting. And using Sturgeon's law, let's face it, 90% of everything's rubbish. You know, that's, uh, Sturgeon is a science fiction writer, by the way, just in case needed contextualising. Um, but there's another painting that I'm conversant with, 
and I think you've been curating, it's been reflected in your curating, and you can speak about it later, it's reflected in your practice, um, and that is, there is a kind of painting that is, has embraced and acknowledges the legacy of conceptual art. As you're well aware, there's a lot of other people who think, oh God, it's all gone to head in a handcart. And this comes, this is, this is, this is manifestly obvious. Every time there's a Turner Prize, somebody will stand up, uh, he'll know who it is, and they'll stick a microphone in the face of some celebrity, for want of a better word, and say, do you think this year it's conceptual art or painting? Now, first off, that not only is that a false dichotomy, you know, do you like cheese or sawdust, you know, or do you eat cheese or sawdust rather, um, but it's also, it, it's also disparaging and offensive in so, many, in so many ways, I can't tell you. And having been witness to this history, this evolution of painting being declared dead in the 60s and being marginalised, punished for its alleged hegemony, you know, seen to be dominant and, and, and uh, wrong-headed, etc. Um, it's, it, the inference is that the, the new technology carries with it a new intelligence. The old is bad, the new is good. Now that's a kind of hangover from late modernism and it's kind of sort of knee-jerk and lazy journalism in my opinion. You'll excuse me occasionally when I look at my notes because I don't want to just, I can ramble for Britain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, okay. Right. As a, as a student in the 60s when conceptualism was pretty becoming the, the a dominant discourse, I think. The two dominant isms, as I've already stated, were feminism and Marxism, and that's really shaped those discourses. Incidentally, I'll, I'll clar I, I want to discuss one element of the impact that Marxism had upon conceptual art. All too often, we are led to believe that um, the YBAs are somehow, you know, the sort of uh, the the grandchildren of Duchamp, right? and they've embraced conceptual art. I think that is hogwash, I think that is PR, I think that is, I just don't buy it. They are the children of Thatcher, they are not the grandchildren of Duchamp. Uh, I don't want to get into that now, but the whole thing, my, you know, one of my many hobby horses, etc. Um, having been there and, and seen what happened, and realising uh, that one orthodoxy was being usurped by another, actually doesn't create, doesn't solve the problems of what you do about orthodoxy. Uh, I'm a, don't forget, I'm a, 50 years ago when you were an art student, to be to the sort of left of Trotsky would, is the sort of preferred position sort of thing. Uh, radical doesn't begin to describe it even by today's standards. Um, it was to, you, you would, the default position was always to contest to always be sceptical, to always be dissenting. That was the driving force, that's the motivating force, right? Um, and so, part of the legacy for me, this is a very, very personal, very autobiographic, it's very personal history, obviously, is the fact that I, as a student, acknowledged what was going on, you know, I. I'm not going to go into all the names and the full history, but yes, I was very absorbed and I bought into the whole discourse. But what I found really worrying and disturbing was this, this new orthodoxy. Everybody's banging on about how the life room had stifled creativity in the mid of the 20th century. But then it was suddenly, going back to the thing about painting bad, you know, uh, conceptual art good. That false dichotomy, because it doesn't cut down quality lines, so nothing to do with quality whatsoever. It was everything to do with, uh, as I say, fashion, dominant discourse, and the emergence of lots of new technologies and stuff. Um, a group of us, because we were so dissenting, decided that in ever, instead of trying to seek approval by going along with the party line and you know dancing to the music of time, as it were, that we would hide in plain sight. If you wanted not to be approved of and patronised, then you took a contrary position, yeah? You were dissenting. And the, the way to, to make that dissent manifest was to paint, yeah? 
a massive irony, I know, but nobody really, nobody really kind of countenanced it. They would dismiss you, yeah? But at the same time, the ideas that were prevalent were being absorbed. And so that, that led me to ask questions about things like um, originality, self-expression, all of the kind of um, authenticity and taste. Uh, and eventually I've come to the conclusion that, and I've written a book about this, as you can well imagine. The book, by the way, is called I Don't Like Art. Um, and it's, it's basically, it comes down to the, how facile and how commodified our thinking has become, yeah? And I owe that sort of uh, sense of doubt, of, of uh, self-scrutiny, uh, to my education, which was dominated, as I say, by conceptualism. Um, it has... I'll just stop to draw a breath. <laughs> yes, basically, um, the idea... So, so, basically, contesting originality, uh, self-expression, authenticity, taste, all of these things were somehow um, the war cries of, of modernism, late modernism and early postmodernism, to an extent. And if I had a quid for every time somebody said to me, oh, keep it open, keep it free, you know, make it larger, you know, let yourself, you know, relax and all that stuff. Let yourself, and go. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, let yourself go. I mean, there is a, it's as if there was only one kind of art student that these people were ever going to address or talk to, yeah? And I tell you, this really came home when I was professor of painting at the Royal College of Art. Candidates would come in, put their work out for interview, and then they'd sit there, obviously very nervous, would make them a cup of tea, give them a biscuit, and say, whoa, you know, not gonna play against the right answer, this is the Royal College, we do things differently, okay? <laughs> uh, just tell us what it's about. And they'd start talking about their work, and then in May, before two or three minutes are up, they'd say, and of course my tutor doesn't like my work. And I'd be sitting there, and the other people, and we had student reps on it as well, and we'd all be sitting there quietly seething, but of course it's, there's a certain etiquette about interviews. You can't say, what? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Who, who is this? Give me, give me, yeah. where does he live? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah. what I learned from that period was it wasn't about approval or disapproval. It wasn't about whether I liked what you do and dislike what you do. That's got damn all to do with anything, particularly in a public discourse particularly in a place like this or in higher education or education of any kind. It's ultimately controlling and I find it uh, morally reprehensible. I really do. Because there's a whole debate now going on about institutions and power. And uh, Listen, anybody who's ever heard the name Foucault knows what I'm talking about. This is not about Foucault, it's about me. <laughs> 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 so there you are, Michelle, stick that in your pipe. Um, anyway, right, so what happened was... Uh, Basically, it, it made me think about the condition or the situation painting was in. Just accepting it as, or, or electing to be marginal or underground, again, reference to my musical tastes, anything esoteric is, some, is, is uh, interests me. Because it's about curiosity, by the way. That was another sort of, um, in fact, something that came out this morning, the idea about curiosity about the material world. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and, to cut a long story short, it allowed me to rethink my painting, so I was able suddenly to paint paintings not only about the paintings that I loved, and I love painting, you know, uh, put life aside, I am alive and I embrace life and all that stuff, I'm not going to go into that again, because so I think of that as rather sanctimonious and um, gratuitous. But academically, I had become fascinated in cubism the kind of formal um, explosion that was modernism, and particularly in the early work of Fernand Léger, who was, as any of you know, fought in the First World War, um, and his work was transformed. He became, uh, what, as far as I'm concerned, the, the most uh, politicised and the most achieved uh, socialist artist, even, even beyond Guernica. This guy, uh, Picasso's Guernica, <coughs> Léger's work after the First World War was totally different. But what I would do, rather than acknowledge the work, is I would pastiche the work, right? So I would be accused of being unoriginal, right? And you think, hey, that's right, bring it on, yes, I want to have this debate. Unoriginal, yeah, maybe. But actually I'm facing up to the fact that I'm panicking about the fact that I'm not going to be an original, yeah? 
There's a lovely joke. Guy comes into an interview at the Royal College of Art, and professor at the time, uh, he puts a sketchbook down, he said, that's my sketchbook, he said, every one of those pages is one of my ideas. And uh, the professor at the time, Francia, said, picks up sketchbooks, looks through them, very, very theatrically, and then puts <laughs> it down and interrupts the conversation we were having with the candidate. Said, oh, you must excuse me, um, I just want to compliment you on being one of the luckiest people I've ever met. Uh, there's a hundred pages in each of these sketchbooks. Uh, and uh, see, there's three or four of them. Um, very, very lucky man. That's about 400 ideas, I'd say. And he said, Do you know, most people think Picasso only had three. And you think, oh, that's it, that's brilliant. That kind of sort of uh, testing the cliche, testing the convention, the, the, the uh, easy, the lazy thinking. Anyway, uh, so my work, it, it, the word appropriation, by the way, was not in the lexicon. Can you imagine a time? I mean, I'm old enough to imagine that time, but I hope there's nobody else in the room who's not that old. Um, but it was, it was a paradigm shift is trite, but it, it was a sea change. It was a real game changer to know that it was okay to actually love other art, particularly painting, yeah? And to find that your relationship with it could be almost unhealthy, yeah? Because my relationship with just about everything is probably pretty unhealthy by most people's standards. Um, right. Um, right. I think that's pretty much nearly. I just want to give me a second or two, and I should just. Yes. One of the things that uh, one of the myths I just want to nail is that, particularly over the YBAs and the use of, of conceptualism, is that. Uh, one of the driving forces in the 60s in conceptual art, one of the discourses happening within, within the conceptual art discourse was, uh, was one about commodification. And it, there was an eye, as a person of the left, as we say, historically and presently, uh, have a passionate, um, a, a lifelong obsession with this. Um, commodification, product, call it what you will. Um, this, um, it was about trying to regain control for the artists, for the producers. It wasn't simply an elegant idea to attach to a marketing ploy at the end of the 20th century. This was about something very different. This was taking, questioning the object and its commodification. Does that make sense? Which is not an argument that is commonly wheeled out these days. And by the way, I, spoke, I taught at Goldsmiths in the 90s, and if you so, men so much as mention Marx or, or um, Gramsci or whoever, right, you were asked to sort of leave the room, okay? So that's how far we've come politically, yeah? Um, right. Uh, Oh, I, I, one thing I just, yeah, I, I, I just want to uh, close on this because there's, there's a lot of, uh, I, I could, as I say, I could ramble on for Britain, but I'm aware of the time. And uh, I just want to sh share this last thought with you, that imagine a time when people were walking around with a copy of Marx under one arm, yeah, and Gurdjieff under the other. Does anybody, everybody, anybody here know who Gurdjieff is? Yeah, okay, right, okay. But for, for those uninformed, basically it was a mixture, and this is where the theosophist. Uh, the, sorry, you're sharing <laughs> private <laughs> jokes. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, it's a, ooh, I'm you're not, not back. And you said hello, so I was like, all right, okay, fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, sorry, you've got to remember that one of the most important driving forces in early modernism that, that led towards the, um, the painting as its own object. Right? And if you think about three painters that manifest that, Kandinsky, Malevich and Mondrian, right? Those are the three works that still stand as paintings as self-signifying. Matisse is over there, Picasso is over there. We talk about subtraction. I'm talking about non-referential painting, because I believe there are three groups. There are no edges to those groups, but there are three distinctions. There are three forms of distinction. And they're distinguished conceptually and art historically. And the thing that makes Malevich, Montreal, and Kandinsky distinct and sets them apart is they were all theosophists, right? And we've recently been hearing about Alma Klimt, yes, 
some of you probably know of her work, it's because of the changing discourse, yeah? Um, and they all had copies, and 1911 is the year when everything became non-referential, you know, if you want to say, say modernism had started then and this ended that. Uh, but in 19, 1899, a book was written by a man called Leadbeater, the Reverend Leadbeater. It was called Thought Forms. Now, it's a fascinating book, but make sure if you do see a copy, it's a coloured copy, because auric, or the discussions of aura and the esoteric, uh, in black and white, don't make any sense at all. <laughs> it's like having snooker on television in black and white. It, it was crap before colour telly, right? Okay. Uh, and then the guy still said it's the, the red ball is the one behind the white ball and all that nonsense. <laughs> uh, but anyway, listen, so just leave you with this, uh, this thought. Um, yeah, it, cha it changed me, well, as you can see, it's, it's sort of animating me at least. Uh, and one of the, to use one very lumpy idea, so, so imagine a world where socialism and, and mysticism, if you like, are, are co coexisting. These are things that are characterised in the current, you know, uh, Western spectrum as, as antipathetical, yeah, or you know, mutually exclusive. So that's that's real difference. But this this is a time at the time of fresh Estonia, where people were thinking differently, and conceptual art was, you know, for me, it was the was the was the opening of that, the, the opening of the rolling away of the stone to quote another Crowley. Um, understanding, yes, I'll just give you an example of, uh, there's only one word for it, it's epistemology, theory of knowledge, right? I'll give you one really beautiful example of this, and it's about the beautiful mind, ultimately, not just the beautiful object. You have to, I think you have to, I know it sounds a bit kind of flaky, but I do think you've got to have, what i talk about some other time, a beautiful mind, a well-disciplined, and open, and curious, and healthy, ultimately, mind. Uh, not a fixed, closed mind, we all know that. Uh, but understanding, yeah, just, I, I've got to read this. It, it's about applied epistemology, you know, the theory of knowledge comes like this. Understanding the difference between, in quotes, justified belief, right, and an opinion. And in the current flaky kind of sort of, you know, maelstrom of kind of tweeting and all the rest of it, it's important, I think, to understand that difference. A justified belief. What I've just been sharing with you, as they say, is a justified set of beliefs, yeah? They're not bloody opinions. They're not something I dreamt up on the train on the way here, like, oh, I think... It's not. I know what day it is, you know what I mean? And I go, I'm really early and wrote all these notes to sort it out. <laughs> for me, if not for anybody else. Okay? I shall rest my very, very lengthy pace. <laughs> okay? And I'm very prepared to take a... Uh, but one thing, there's a link here. Rosalind and I have worked very closely together, and I must confess that I, you were a student of the Royal College. Yeah, you were not, but we became very close friends whilst you were at the Royal College, for reasons that I think some of which I have to explain. But you started Zap, and that's where we met again. Yeah. You were my boss. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's... it's uh, I came at painting through another discipline. I came through paint, to painting through textiles. And um, I studied mixed media textiles at the Royal College um, and decided I didn't want to make things that were just decorative. You know, uh, I didn't want to kind of work off mood boards or seasonal and, you know, I, and I kind of totally rejected uh, that kind of aspect of the tes textiles um, kind of uh, department really, and uh, and they didn't know what to do with me really, in a way, uh, because uh, the kind of territory and the context was different as a painter, and so really at that point it's saying yes, I'm you know I want to be conceptual, I want to have a reason for making a painting, I want to have a discourse, I want to have um, I want to use materials in a way that expresses um, something of the world or of the interior world. Um, and so Graham really came to teach me, um, you know, they came over very generously and, and taught me. Um, so I so it came at painting through that yeah. sort of yeah. different angle. Um, and for me, sort of, I think we, I was reading your I Don't Like Art book yeah. on the way, um, and there was something that, you know, the painting is a discourse, a great conversation between ourselves, our fears and our desires. 
Um, and I think that's, that's really important and having this sort of mindfulness. Um, my work, you know, just to kind of take this sort of aspects of textiles has always been very present in my work. Um, and how I, so you, you have to look closely, but there's threads on that painting up there. And I often get painters saying to me, why don't you just paint that line? <laughs> you know, like, why bother? Uh, and uh, as if, like, it's somehow less a painting for having another material within it. Um, the thread is there very purposefully and symbolically. It's there to sort of make a statement about how thread has traditionally been used as a sort of feminine um, and kind of nurturing aspect or reparative aspect and I certainly did use that symbolically in some works but now the, the work has changed um, and it's much more about puncturing a, a kind of space and that space is not just the painting space that is also the space of uh, the art world of the painting world of a world uh, that I now inhabit that's kind of the abstract abstract geometric world in a way uh, one that is and the architectural world one predominantly all of those are predominantly male oriented. So me having a presence as a woman and not sort of sitting quietly and saying, oh, um, I'm an abstract painter now or something, you know, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. Mm. Um, and sort of saying, there's kind of many aspects of that as a curator, as an educator, um, but also as a feminist to sort of say, I'm sorry, but you don't have enough women in this show. Um, or, you know, bringing up those kind of subjects, or why is it that your programme only has men in it? Or why is painting predominantly thought of as male by male artists often, male painters? That's, that's sort of the things I kind of come up against, and I know that's certainly mm -hmm. something we were talking about earlier, and maybe that's kind of where you come in. Yeah, as well. okay, so a um, bit of background for me quickly. Um, is that I studied painting both at BA and MA. Um, and on my BA at Cheltenham, it was, I think it was uh, probably known as a course that had a, a, you know, it was quite a traditional painting course. But within, within that, um, very quickly, I really enjoyed pushing this stuff around, but I got in a hell of a muddle. Didn't really know what the hell I wanted to paint. So it just became this frustrating kind of activity, really, of just, you know, enjoying the, the gunk of it. Um, and gradually, over the course of time, there was a shift that happened of just sort of piling stuff in my studio and recognising that more interesting things were happening, sort of naturally, and kind of assembling bits of packaging, collecting egg boxes, appropriating sort of ready-mades that you know you don't usually just have any importance so toilet rolls cardboard boxes and enjoying the colors the slight shifts um, and just really playfully quite dumbly just putting things together and playing them about and then making constructed paintings um, with those objects and getting engrossed in the play of the dialogue between a three-dimensional form and a flat kind of image that related to the object. And that's kind of where, where I came to the Royal College really, was having then started making models and the role of the model in my practice had become much more significant. So very quickly made three-dimensional sketches of quite abstract events at that time and then making an oil painting of it. Um, and then actually at the Royal College, not really making painting at all, just making these quite big objects. Um, and, and now, I guess, yeah, I, I, I consider myself to have come through this territory or this discourse of painting where I feel very at home. But at the same time, I'm very reticent to call myself a painter because I'm aware that I make these objects and they're not, you know, conventionally painting on canvas. And I have come up against this thing of, you know, oh, you're not a painter, painter, you know. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I, yeah, I find that kind of um, dismissive and problematic mm. yes. um, and anti-discourse, yeah. really. Um, and that 
you know, like sometimes that tends to be a kind of male perception in my experience. Mm. Um, yeah, so something, I guess the objects that I'm interested in or my process of making, which probably links this idea of my understanding of post-conceptual painting is this combination of linking together the idea, the concept or concepts and the process of making and like how those are, um, they're kind of woven together and they're not kind of able to be separated out. So my, my process tends to start with a curiosity about an object or objects, quite often technology that we use, so phones, laptops, watches, um, and a very sort of surface knowledge of those objects. I don't understand how they work, but I'm really intrigued by them. So my response to them is to like want to try and remake them, but from a very sort of uh, ontological kind of experience of them. And through that process of making, it kind of cracks them open. And from a single object, it feels like it kind of opens up these other references to other things through the glitches of the handmade and you know, messing it up with glue and subverting the slickness of, of technology. Um, and then more recently, I've got interested in plants and how looking at plants and flowers um, again, just as a curiosity about the form and the actual probably key drive to instigate the making is this just a pure pleasure in looking and recording and just, you know, that absolute, as simple as that. Um, and putting, putting that, that process through lots of different filters of uh, recording in gouache on paper, doing drawings in felt tip pen, putting things together with cardboard, then making drawings and paintings of the maquettes in process, and then information from that feeds back in again um, to the new new version of itself. I've gone a bit off piste, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was the idea of plant, thinking of plants at the moment and how they can be, um, it's both an escape, an escape from the sort of contemporary world, you know, this kind of stillness and back to nature, but it's also thinking of them as these highly sophisticated kind of um, prototypes for future technology, um, yeah, on a sort of microscopic level, how they, how these things grow and put together and how they function. So sort of leaves as really high-tech solar panels. And yeah, so that's in a nutshell where I'm coming from. <laughs> where do we go from here? <laughs> Sorry, there, there was a rider to this. Um, in a week or two's time, there's, there was a doc. Basically, Claire was in a in a uh, an exhibition in my studio workshop uh, this this summer. I can't clean. Sue was also in this show, <laughs> right? And uh, we made a documentary about it, a film about it, and I do a guided tour talking about the work. And I was so glad to hear you say that you haven't got a clue about how they work. Because yeah. not only have you not got a clue about how anything works, <laughs> I think me and probably most people in this room, irrespective of male or female, haven't got a bloody clue about how anything works these days, yeah? So I'm not the only one who has panic attacks when I can't find my phone, yeah? I thought I'd lost it yesterday, I thought, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm of the generation when my kids say to me, so Dad, like, what happens when before you had mobile phones and you had to go to an appointment? And you say, well, you couldn't phone up and say, oh, running late, see you in 10. Say, well, no, you, you, you couldn't do that. You had to be early. I mean, I got here at 10.30 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is... The, sorry, that's, that's the testimony itself for me. By the way, the show is called A Table of Elements, and it was 20 contemporary painters, or people who work within a, the painterly discourse. But, correct me if I'm wrong, I think almost half of the things in that... You, just, you, yes, you were in that show as well, yeah? And uh, there are some people, I'm not one of them, who might say, well, is that really painting? I've had yours? this problem, yeah. You might have had this problem, <laughs> yes, this you problem. might have had this problem. I relate to what you were saying. Yeah because for a long time I, I stopped making work using paint but yeah. considered the work 
that I made all about painterly discourse. So I was making works that related very much to discourse around painting, but without paint. Mm. And I, just like an anecdote, I, I remember getting really excited about this idea about all of these artists that were making objects, maybe, or things related to painting, and wanting to propose an article to quite a famous magazine that's based on painting. And I proposed this idea <laughs> and was kind of rebuffed with the kind of idea I was kind of saying, I, I'd really like to talk about some of these artists that are making things that are about painterly discourse, but maybe paint isn't in the equation. And I was told that I was missing something because the clue was in the title of this painting. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it's kind of interesting that you come up against that. And yeah. so many artists that have painted for years, as I did, and then you might be making other things, or like the work that was in your show, which for me is all about painting, but there isn't any paint. It's two pages put together. But it is a discourse, mm -hmm. you know. But I wonder whether that openness, like, I, I mean, I was hearing you talk, Graham, about you know, studying at St Martin's and, you know, among conceptual artists and things and having that perspective on the lineage of how things have developed. And maybe when I was at college, you know, that was taken for granted. So I guess the people teaching me didn't have that preciousness of like, this is what painting is, this is what sculpture is. And so there was a kind of, within the painting departments, both at the Royal College and at Cheltenham, there wasn't, a, you know, I wasn't challenged at all. I was perfectly, you know, mm -hmm. encouraged to explore my practice or what I needed to make mm -hmm. within that kind of discourse. Mm -hmm. And and I found that framework of painting something really helpful to kind of react against and kind of, yeah, to have that dialogue with that. You know, how does my work relate to the wall? Is there a surface and ground? What happens when it becomes three-dimensional and these objects are painterly and you apply materials onto a surface and all yeah all of those things that are I think are painterly languages um, but not necessarily manifested in a painting yes I think um, both you and I we go between three-dimensional and two-dimensional my work my paintings are very three-dimensional without but they're 2d um, and out of that was born um, installations and sculptural installations um, with steel and perspex and they're the same language to me it's not like this is painting this is installation you know of course it's not that's like dumb you know it's like of course they're related you know and even I had a show recently and I had a provisional painting I called it really I mean I don't know why I called it provisional it was just painting but it was provisional in the sense of it was constructed out of there was one bit of canvas which was a real challenge to a, a young man that came along to the talk there was this one bit of canvas and then perspex and steel kind of laid up in kind of configuration and it would be how I would approach my painting or I might paint that and then bring something else in and it's like it's not separate like that you know and that's sort of again being a painter painter and sticking religiously to one medium is just something that um and which is nothing wrong with that it's just that it's about that dialogue and the curiosity to see where can I go with materials where can I go with my ideas how can I push myself how can I be curious how can I work within a different space what that bring how can I work with other people your idea of what painting is, this history that we all carry. Mm. It's called, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm having a conversation with myself about it when I'm not sort of, I don't know, in the shower, well yeah, maybe I am, but you know I mean, maybe trying to remember, or more recently in fact, very interesting lesson, yeah, Duchamp had his chest, I've decided at the age of 67 to start playing the piano. Now, trust me, this is a very big ask, right, but what it does is it brings me back to this idea of mental panesthetics, the idea of sort of um, feeling the, is it dopamines and endorphins and all the rest mm -hmm. of it? Getting back to what people were referring to this morning, like excitement, you know, because, if, you know, to, to wake up happy each morning is scary. I mean, you, you're going to lose friends. That's not how it works. There are moments, you know, in, in, in like props, and that's why I've decided I, I want to try and <laughs> make use of this hand because I am very right-handed, right? Okay, that's again a cultural thing. Um, but, and I find the whole process fascinating and it's re-engaging me with the idea of learning, 
Because I said to somebody jokingly the other day, I said, do you know, I can't remember the last time I learned something. I think it was a June afternoon in 1973. I think it was hot, don't I mean, this doesn't happen like that, right? And it's a very, very exciting feeling. But I have to go outside of painting. And I mean, you know, Justin and I share a lot of uh, interest in fairly esoteric and sort of um, liminal, I think is the expression, music. Things like power electronics and industrial music and sort of ambient stuff. Like that. And uh, it's that, it's that. Going back to this thing about beautiful mind, beautiful object, the relationship. And I think that's why people, I'm one of the people who is yeah, brought up with so much that was abject. And the only way you can deal with these ideas, real descent, is to have the tools, the art historical, the, uh, the critical theory, the idea of how to manage to negotiate these massive and, and sometimes very seductive propositions and ideas. And uh, it's the discourse that's painting, and that's why I'm convinced it's a discourse. Because when I meet people who think it's an activity and they show me what they've been doing, they're probably right. For you, it might be an activity. That's not the way I see this thing. I, you know, I talk to myself about it 24/7. Yeah, I carry it all the time. It's like some. In fact, you touched upon it. You talked about what you needed to do, like some compulsion, some obsession. There's, there's a kind of. You, you know, when you're talking to a careerist, because they always talk about what they want to do next. They have plans. <laughs> Right, I, I, I mean, as I say, you realise I'm 67, I'm just trying to get through from day to day and stay alive suddenly, yeah? And therefore, it re you really do cut to the chase about needing to do things, yeah? Standing around at bus stops, you know, that's not for me anymore, I haven't got the time for that. I'm the guy who gets to the barbers at 8 o'clock in the morning, as you probably noticed, to get the first cut at 9 o'clock, right? <laughs> so the time, issues like that, no, it's all informed by that discourse. That's its reality. It shapes the mind that you have. It changes consciousness. It has for me. And when I come across people, and I make no bones about it, I cannot abide things like the Royal Academy Summer Show for all its cold egalitarianism and inclusivity and, you know, oh, it's very democratic. You're such a snob. No, I'm not being a snob. I just, I just can't abide the idea that three or four people who don't know what's going on outside of Burlington House sit in a room and, and choose what they like and then stick it on and have the audacity to put it on the walls and get the media in to actually bray over it. I mean... I, am I the only person in the room who actually <laughs> seems to me sort of have a problem here? You know, and you think that, going right back to it, the reason that people, and, and it happened, oh, well, I have to say, it happened at Goldsmiths because I was there, I was in the room at the time, as they say. Um, and I can remember not only talk of the left being kind of forbidden, but also that it was okay to say that you liked something. So here was somebody being really rigorous, you know, and sort of searching, and they're going, yeah, but then ultimately I like, really like red. <laughs> and, it, and if you contested it, it in my day, you'd say, you what? You know, what's your mouth out? It was, <laughs> then, then it moved to a position where people were so accepting and so kind of um, tolerant and intellectually flaccid, to be honest, that, uh, and I, I, as I say, that is the nub, that's the kernel. And somebody said to me, said, well, if you get rid of like and dislike from how you work, right? so what do you do? What does one do? Yeah? Um, and it's because of my uh, education. And, and by the way, through conceptual art, I met people like Richard Volheim, you know, the writer, philosopher, art and its objects, painting as an Painting as a fine art. Ha! That's a brilliant book. It's about 300 pages, and around about page 200, Richard suddenly realises that when you're painting, you're never more than a metre and a bit away from what you're making. Bravo! <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's sort of 30 years in academia well spent. Yeah. Um, no, it, it should change who you are. It changes what you think and how you behave, how you treat other people. So the ethical comes back in yeah. for me. And I think that's something that's been um, exercised, excised, oh, anyway, kicked, booted out, whatever. So, I, so obviously I got up at five this morning as I'm going into a late middle age sort of <laughs> sugar box it. Um, and I, I, find, I found, I was in the, as I say, in the room when that was being coming sort of wrote, that was becoming sort of uh, uh, absorbed into discourse. But that's, that's been like that. 
No, 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 not like that. No, I just want to say that. It's not like that now. Which bit? Goldsmiths, not like that now. Oh no, it's not like that now. No, it isn't. No, it's a very different place. In yeah. fact, very curious thing happened. The opposite. Come. The opposite. Yes. It, well, we got to a situation around about 1990 when doing the interviews. I was in the interview panel at Goldsmiths, and one of the guys who said the Basil Beatty it was turned around to me and. Uh, uh, Brian, Fulton Bridge, people like that. They turned around to me and said, Graham, do you sometimes get the feeling that these people have already been here? <laughs> <laughs> because the actual idea of what it was had already got into the water. Yeah. yeah. And it had to change. And, and changed massively. Do you teach there or? No, no, I just graduated from there. On the MFA. Which course were you doing? On the MFA. On the MFA. MFA. Who's running it now? David Brown. David Brown. Yes, David Rabb, right. yes. He was a student there, wasn't he? Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, David. Yes, yeah. like I was to the Royal College. You know, yeah. boy and man. <laughs> yeah. Give him my regards on your next scene. I've finished, so... Well, you'll see, see, see him. He's still alive. That's an interesting statement. No, I'm... I've finished. I'm out there. I've grown up now. I'm fully qualified. Yeah, I'm fully qualified. You make the work I want to make now. Yes, my life's my own again. Yes. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> But that thing of, I, like, I don't mean to be a bit contentious again, yeah. you know, like the, no, the no. like dislike thing. I think there is a, you know, coming out of college when you suddenly go, oh, fuck, you know, yeah. I can make what I want to make, yeah. but then that that is the starting and point. And you don't have to justify it. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to justify it. There's nobody in the room. Yeah, there's nobody in the room. But actually, in a way, that, that seems to be a really positive starting point, you know, like a really genuine yeah. instinct, I guess, of, oh, that's the drive, that's, you know, that's what I like, or that's what I find aesthetically pleasurable, that's what I'm going to do. And then out of that, like, little kernel comes this other stuff, or I guess asking the questions, like, why do I like that? Yeah, why exactly, do I like that? Yes, 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 yeah. follow it up a bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a shame. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it that a lot of ideas come out of making? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly. Yes, yes. Start with the stuff. Mm. Exactly. Uh, you go on a journey, yeah. and then ideas you you cue Curious, yeah. you, you pull, and I think artists are sort of like magpies as well. You pull a bit of philosophy, you pull a bit yeah. of nothing, but you're not a theorist and you're not a philosopher. And I just struggle with <laughs> heavy, 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 juicy lecturers, which I think, oh God, I really wish I'd read the whole of Heidegger before I got here. Yeah. <laughs> this morning. But yeah. we do that, you know, yeah. and that doesn't mean that we're amateurs, it means we're yeah. just after something else. Yeah. But the process of making. Think is the thing that drives the yeah. work and the curiosity and the intelligence. Uh, yeah. Because ideas are visual. Yeah. They're yeah. Not the intelligence. Visual texts. No, quite. Yeah. In fact, that's what you do. Is you are somehow um, filtering all the time and mediating mm. this, the, these ideas, or whatever they were, propositions and texts and all the rest of it, and it informs how you behave. Right. Okay, and that means what you invest the object with, yeah, what your intentions are, what, and maybe morally and ethically what you need to do, rather than being product or commodified, as a, which is why it worries me so much, because you think, oh God, I've got to make some red ones now, you know, or I've got to make bigger ones and be freer. Oh, good on. <laughs> Help, let me out now. I think there was a really uh, fantastic. Um, Talk that you, it was at Farms show, um, oh, yeah. Campus and Cream. Um, there were a lot of, um, which is suspiciously low low amount of uh, male painters here, yeah. but um, <laughs> <laughs> here's there were a lot, um, yeah. and uh, there was this whole Once. yeah his yeah. once once yeah, yeah. Um, and Juan makes these exquisite paintings. You probably know his work, um, and uh, Are you familiar with it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and they're very they're very humorous and, and, and they're very precise. Yeah. Precision is everything with, with Juan. Um, and, it's, and it's wonderful. And so somebody kind of asked this crazy question yeah. about, but is it expressive? <laughs> because obviously to be expressive, you have to chuck and paint around, you know, and it's like, we all just sort of, what? <laughs> uh, I can't get, I mean, no, 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 no. I came, was brilliant. I, I came mean, in on it. I said, uh, 
what, so like, is it like wrong to use a ruler? Uh, I said, where does this wrong stop? You know? Yeah. Uh, but the, in all seriousness, that really, that was the tip of the iceberg, literally, because the one, one of the really extraordinary uh, conversations that happened in through the 60s and 70s because of conceptualism was people started to question uh, ideas of authenticity and expression, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'll just give it a very potted version that, uh, that my understanding, and it's, it, yes, exactly, as time cracks on. Uh, people would, expressionists, or people would claim for things uh, of ex work, painting that is expressionistic, it's a public claim, it's not my claim, I'll come to that in a minute, uh, that they were trying to, they were being instinctive, they were trying to, and this is the, this is the kernel, this is the bit of grit in the what's it, they were trying to get it down before their brain filtered yes. it, and they're cheating, <laughs> you know, this kind of mendacious, sort of, of like, they should be, over, you know, flattering themselves that their brain is such a high-functioning organ, right, that they would get in and contrive this artfulness and stuff, this artifice. And I thought, hey, yeah, okay. But the more you hear that, the more you think, hold on. It, I mean, I have nothing against Frank Arbuck, but he's a very, very good example, and you know, it's why Glenn Brown does Arbuck, so I'm not going to get into that now, That's a, that, but that has some bearing on what I'm saying. Is In 1952, if you make that discovery, and you know, let's, let's remember the world was a different place, Skiffle was just coming out of jazz, uh, rock and roll was a glint in somebody else's eye, etc. Um, the idea of liberating yourself from 19th century academic, you know, uh, models is, is, is kind of exciting and worthy and healthy. But if you are still banging on the same drum 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, the question is, are you a very slow learner or did you not realise that at the outset it was your cheating brain that made the decision to actually opt for this form of activity? Get it? It's, it's self-denying. You cannot, if you have that awareness, as I do, I have to make things that are nailed down tightly uh, so I can understand what I'm doing, so I can have ownership of it. Does that make sense? Not fly by the seat of somebody else's pants uh, on some borrowed, nostalgic and quite wonderfully... You know, I, I wish the world was still flat, you know. Why still flat? <laughs> and quieter. <laughs> and we were living in the 14th century. <laughs> anyway, now I've made my point. Basically, the, the expressionism there is there is an absurdity to it, in, in my opinion, because if you look at those who adopt such things for the best of intentions, I'm not suggesting that they do it out of a lack of integrity. It's just that you must have something you learn on Monday, which is why I'm interested in learning the piano, to play the piano. You know, if you're still banging away at it, as I am on Friday, yes, you are a slow learner, or you're rubbish. Uh, I'm sorry, between the two. Uh, but the idea that a whole world of discourse, the idea that sort of integrity and expression can be um, embraced by this fallacy, I find unsustainable, untenable. And I can only think like that because of the education I had. Does that make sense? And, and that's what I've tried to pass on to people when I meet them. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's what I think distinguishes the, the college and, and the things that we've been doing at ZAP, because uh, Justin's involved with ZAP, for those of you who don't know. She's our boss, aren't they? Boss. Yes. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. I was your boss as well. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to get into who's no. who's, <laughs> who's who's mentor. But yeah, that's another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's so. No. Yes. No. <laughs> anyway. Oh, oh. Yes. 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 Uh, has anyone got any? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, Man asked me out of heart. I agree. Um, kind of like if I made a collage, then I'd just say it's a collage. And if I made a painting, I'd say it's a painting. And there's been, yesterday there was this kind of chat about I made this painting, but there's no paint on it. And I think, well, it's 
you know, as a man. So. <laughs> What you're saying is, you subscribe to the idea that painting is an activity. Um, I think that you can have a discourse around painting by writing, but you're not going to say that's a painting. We're having a discourse around painting here, but no one's going to claim that we're making painting now, or maybe they are. So if you're having a discourse around painting by making uh, some other object which isn't a painting, yeah. why are you going to say No, 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 but I'm saying there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tautology or a kind of flaw in that logic, because what you're suggesting without explaining is what it is that you're defining painting as. Is it simply just, you know, wet stuff squeezed out of a tube onto a flat surface? You see, that paint, you mean? Yeah, exactly, yes, but that's the kind of uh, lengthy tautological sort of stuff that people were coming out with then, yes? I'm just staring at the pot, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, what I'm saying is, I've, I have been standing around that pot for the last 50 years, and that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny because what I think about when I think about painting isn't simply paint. No, you think about painting. The act yes, of yes. Mm. Yeah, I th that's what I'm saying. I was trying to explain that I am thinking. No, I mean, I'm, yeah, no, no, I'm not no, painting no, now, but I'm thinking about painting now. Yeah, yeah, but you, but you, yeah. But that's the legacy. Yeah, but hold on. Yes, yeah, but that's the, my point. Is that is the legacy for my generation of conceptual art? It's changed that relationship between an activity and an idea, if you like. And that's why I, I personally, and I think most people I've met recently, think of painting as a discourse because I can shut my eyes and I can see painting. Yeah, I can think about painting. It's. And I, I, as I say, I've been around, I, I've seen it being declared, things like painting is dead. That, I mean, that was a, that's, I mean, it's laughable, but what was fascinating was the idea that it was painting as an activity was deemed dead. Does that make sense? Because people were very much locked into the idea of describing the, uh, creativity through the media that was being used, yeah? And in fact, that's why it's led, I just going a little bit off piece at present, to what I think of as ludicrous propositions where you have, I, mean, I, I think of the painting department I worked in as having a history and having an illustrious discourse, yes, and, and history. Uh, but when I think about printmaking, I think of a process, do you know what I mean? I think of that as differently defined. That's all. I'm, I'm thinking like, my, I guess my practice in general I describe within a painterly kind of discourse. But the, in, in your kind of term of reference, I guess, the bit of my practice that you would say is painting is where I might record an object with gouache on paper, and that would be a painting. But actually when I, the function of it, it within my practice is more like I would define it more like drawing, like yeah, that yeah, action, yeah. it's like, you know, the way I use paint and the way I, you know, put it on paper and the function of it. And then the object that usually comes out of a combination of all these things is much more like painting in that it's kind of a crystallisation of an activity that's fluid and in flux and kind of wet, if you like, and then it kind of dries into this kind of solidified object. But it's metaphorical because it's just the ideas that mm. do that behave like the process of painting. But it's yeah. not a painting no. in that kind of definition. No, that's why I'm saying I'm, no, I'm, that was I'm right. very, very. I think painting is a discourse. I mean, that's really clear. That's, that's that's what I think. You get it? Uh, you, you may have a different definition, but I think painting is a discourse. That's what I think. Anyway. Yeah. What is it? Yeah, when you make a painting, that's you all have a conversation with that thing that you're. That's a kind of, and that's constant when you're in front of it. You're reacting to it, chatting with it in a sense of make like it's sort of telling you what to do. But so are collages, so are drawings. No, I know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But like, you know, paintings, if you look around here as well, I could describe, you know, you could talk about a lot of these paintings as collages. You know, there are lots of fractured pieces or compositionally, they're kind of ideas or bits of images collaged together. So like, where does one yeah. discipline start and the next stop? Or 
It all depends on the filter that you're, that you're looking through. Yeah, yeah. I've just said for that it's other than an activity. There's something that distinguishes it from just getting stuff out of the tube and sticking it on the wall. I think it's just all the point I suppose I was trying to make. I just think it's interesting that so many people aren't using paint, but they're yes. talking about it. They're so talking about painting. That's, paint. that's exactly my point. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't, doesn't the other, I mean, the tension comes into it. Mm. So your intention when you're using certain materials, that comes into to what you're trying to say. Yeah. And another thing, uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Marcus, we've met. You. Oh, Marcus, it is me. <laughs> I was thinking, is that Marcus Cove? <laughs> sorry, give me, give me a break, it was five years ago. And uh, I had longer hair and you had shorter hair. <laughs> um, damn. <laughs> Uh, come, come to the lady. Sorry. Oh, sorry, what were you talking about? Uh, I was just saying, you know, the, the material, like, because I used to work in the graphic arts, and I was using my work, and, <clears throat> and you could call it drawing, but when I'm making the work, I feel like I'm making a painting, mm. and I feel like I'm intending to, to say something, yeah. because that's that, because I feel that it's, it's speaking, it's saying something, and I think that's probably what you mean about the discourse. You know, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm trying, or the work has a voice, and so I just bring in the, the, anything that I can use in order to say that thing. And it doesn't really matter what you bring to it. You know. Actually, yeah, that's what I wanted to pick up on, Marcus, was the, um, I identify now quite willfully and deliberately as a painter, yeah? And if people call me an artist, I, I can get quite prickly. <laughs> I just I have I, why? why? Who yeah. said that? Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Um, basically, uh, well, I've written a book about it. Okay. I mean, he's got a copy. He's infinitely intelligent. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think of a short answer to that that doesn't take the rest of the day. Um, I don't feel a part of, I feel part of, of a very particular discourse, right, and I work within that tradition, and if you chose 50 years ago to work within that tradition, you were a dick, you were a, 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 a Neanderthal, you were a dinosaur, but now, rather like the thing about the interest in materiality, materials, uh, the small, things have changed massively. And also, you know, uh, the thing I uh, talk about, uh, forgive me, Goldsmiths, a long time ago. What do you want? <laughs> I think there's also, um, you know, there are, there are paintings which lots of painters would probably say they're not paintings, like spot paintings or anything Mark Quinn's ever made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a yeah, well, uh, that's interesting. Paint, yeah, that's interesting because other people paint his paintings, don't they? Well, regardless, I mean, they do. But well, yeah. yeah. Um, should 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 I, should I, should I, sorry, Marcus, what's your point? Yeah, go on. I'm sorry, I'm trying to. Sorry. Um, well, I suppose I'm standing up for making a collage and calling it a painting because we look at some paintings and think that that's not painting mm. in a sense. But hold on, it's, that's it's just. It's a manufacturer of an idea, sort of, that, that doesn't have, have any sort of part of a painting. Although, um, that's just my opinion. It's the question. Justified belief. Yeah. Um, I just think there's, that, like, like I said before, you, that, that there's a kind of call and response with the painting. Like you do what the painting tells you. That's how I approach painting. Put things in, you take colours out, you know, yeah. that, 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 that's about the procedure. I don't identify with that procedure. It's as simple as that. I don't, I understand what you're saying and I respect it as different and you know, other and all that stuff. But I, I've been very partisan. I'm talking about my practice and my predilections. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yours are different and I respect that and I know they are. Yeah, and that's fine. Yeah. I just, uh, I've just witnessed so many people use painting as a whipping boy, yeah, for all of the ills of uh, forms of public discourse, you know, moral decline and things like that. And uh, 
that I I identify with it you know, quite passionately, as I say, and I differentiate what I do. Uh, I, I would suggest I differentiate this, this, the spot painting things. I don't, I mean, yeah, they're paintings, but I've, I've got some crockery like that. I don't care, really. You know, I'm seriously that kind of diffident about it. Uh, I'd rather spend my energy on engaging in something that was important or that I needed to engage with rather than something that happened to it already exist. That's, that's my position politically around it. Just, it's a selection, it's a choice I make. And that's why, that's why, I, that's why I mentioned uh, Sturgeon's Law earlier on. But it's, I mean, I'm going to be interested. I think probably I would feel more comfortable talking about myself as a painter than as an artist. Yes. I think it's quite an interesting. Oh, hold what on. is that about? Listen, this, well, yes. I think that's quite, I mean, it caused yeah. more. So that you're saying some, about some kind of resistance about yes. standing next to painting or stand, standing with painting. Standing yes, with painting. as something eternal, not sort of fashionable or transitory. Right. But, yeah, I. I'll tell you what, there's the thing, you know the Stendhal effect? Have you ever heard of that, the Stendhal effect? Weak in the presence of beauty? I think it was a song actually was there at that time as well. <laughs> um, I was in the Brancati Chapel, Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence, and looking at the tribute money, I just, uh, well, just, I just lost it completely, yeah? Uh, and I, I've been exposed to quite a lot of art, yeah? But for some reason, there's something about painting that keeps getting to me and makes me want to get up in the morning and do it. Do you know, you know that question at the back of all of our minds is, what is it? I'm, you know, when you, because I, I, I think best when I'm bored. I, I know it sounds ludicrous, but seriously, you, know, you cleared the decks, you know the gas is turned off, and there's what little bit of a brain you've got left, you can use it and focus it. Um, I. I, as I say, I work when I'm bored, when I can clear the decks, and, I've, and until I can do that, I just, I, I have to be focused to do it, and I find that, somebody said, oh, surely it gets easier as you get older, bollocks, <laughs> no, it doesn't, because what happens, just as you're beginning to get the hang of it, the, 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 this is why they're learning the piano thing, the kind of stuff that's got the hang of it starts to go, <laughs> So you have to, have to make an effort. Is that a good place to finish? <laughs> <laughs> Thank it's not about agreeing. It's not, no, sorry, I, it was, that's where I came in. There was a consensus that the right thing to do was to abandon painting, right? That was a historical moment where 98% of the intelligent voting sort of enga engaged characters went off and abandoned painting. Yeah, and it atrophied, because we're only 2% of the population, relatively speaking, doing it. And most of them are doing it out of habit or as a displacement activity, which is something you were beginning to discuss. So you've all got a different, you know, got to be vigilant about. Uh, yeah, anyway. Can I just say thank yes. you so much yes. for organising well, these talks? Yes. Um, for, for organising this exhibition and uh, all the talks Quite. are so generous and uh, it wasn't generative. just me. I know. Yeah. Wednesday, 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 Wednes